Over 70 bishops from around the world recently signed a fraternal open letter to the German episcopate expressing concern over Germany's controversial synodal path and warning that the heterodox German reform efforts risk fracturing church unity. Here with analysis of this and much more, editor of Catholic World News and visiting fellow at Thomas More College, Philip Lawler, and the National Catholic Register's Vatican correspondent, Edward Penton, reporting from Rome. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, I want to start with the list of signatories to this letter. Uh, it's grown to over 90 now. It includes four red hats, Nigerian Cardinal uh, Francis Arinze, uh, Cardinal Raymond Burke, uh, South African Cardinal Wilfred uh, Napier, and Australian Cardinal George Pell. Now, the letter expresses several concerns with this German synodal path, including undermining the credibility of church teaching and authority, drawing inspiration primarily from sociological analysis and political ideology, replacing a Christian notion of freedom with autonomy, lacking the joy of the gospel, and a focus on power that suggests a spirit fundamentally at odds with the real nature of Christian life, um, undermining the idea of synodality, thus further impeding the Church's necessary conversation about fulfilling the mission of converting and sanctifying the world. That's a mouthful. Phil, uh, what do you make of this letter? The bishops are clearly concerned that what's happening in the German synod will spill over into other countries. Is this letter a warning to perhaps uh, the bishops who look to use the papal synod on synodality to push similar charges and that those proposed changes might not be tolerated? Well, it's certainly a warning, a warning particularly to the German bishops, but to other bishops as well, including the bishops in their own countries, the countries, I mean, of the signatories, most of whom are American, by the way. And it's mm -hmm. a warning, I think, to the bishops of the world that if we go into this synod on synodality and there's a move for the same sort of radical change in church doctrine and discipline, that there will be resistance, that there will be an argument. It's a, to my mind, it's a tremendously positive development that we're having this argument out in the open rather than trying to camouflage what are obviously deep divisions that could become much deeper if, mm -hmm. if there isn't that sort of resistance. Ed, how was this letter received in Rome? And do you see this, do the people in Rome see this as an effort to get the Pope to weigh in on this German synod and what's happening there. I think that's right, Raymond. Yes, I think the, the reaction has been generally positive to this letter. I think some people thought that, why is it taking so long? Uh, of course, the, this synodal mm -hmm. process has been going on for some time now. <clears throat> and I think uh, this, this lot, some people think this is rather overdue. Um, but at, at any rate, they, I think quite a few people are happy about this. Um, and uh, yes, I think it does show also that the Holy Father has um, to draw it to his attention. Of course, he knows about it already, uh, but it, again, mm -hmm. this is a third uh, major letter from, from bishops, the other two being the Nordic bishops and the Polish bishops. Right. Um, and so this will certainly uh, be uh, very much uh, in his entree, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Ed and Phil, uh, very quickly, uh, in, the, in a response to all of this, Bishop uh, Georg Botzing, who's the uh, head of the German Catholic Bishops' Conference, he said... He'd like to counter any concerns that the Germans are trying to neglect, you know, the community of faith here, and try to poo-poo it all. Uh, does that wash, Ed? Um, I don't think so. And I think he's given pretty much the same sort of boilerplate response to, to each of these mm -hmm. letters. And he's saying, well, this is because of the abuse crisis. We had to act. We need to—the Pope expressly asked us to act boldly, and so that's what we've done. Uh, but it, it's not really washing, of course, with, with the bishops who've signed these letters, uh, because that's it, it kind of skates over the real problems, which are the fact that um, they feel that the, these, the synodal path is not scripturally based and it's not in accordance with tradition. Hmm. Uh, Phil, earlier this month, Sister Nathalie Bekar, uh, <clears throat> the undersecretary of the Synod of Bishops, the general secretariat, responsible for coordinating all the Vatican synods. Uh, she delivered an online PowerPoint presentation to New Ways Ministry. Now, this is an organization which promotes gay and transgender rights in the church. 
uh, the subject of the presentation was synodality, a path to reconciliation. Now, bear in mind, New, New Way's ministry was disciplined by the Vatican in the 1990s because of flaws in their approach to ministry. However, in December, Pope Francis praised Sister Janine Gramic's work. She's one of the founders. Phil, what do you make of this, and does it tell us anything about the direction of the current Bishop Synod on synodality? It certainly tells us a great deal about the direction of the general secretariat of the synod. They have been anxious uh, to cooperate with New Ways Ministry and with other similar organizations. Uh, and they're sending mixed messages, which I'm afraid are the hallmark of this pontificate. Uh, the mixed message being, here's an organization that has been uh, subject to uh, scrutiny by the Vatican, subject to a caution by the Vatican, uh, because it was inaccurately portraying the teachings of the Church, uh, and yet the Vatican is anxious to work with this organization. So, it, as I say, it's the hallmark of this pontificate is the mixed messages, the confusion, the outreach to people uh, who are, in fact, undermining the, the teaching of the Church, and this in the guise of synodality uh, so that it really adds to the tension that a lot of us are feeling that this synod on synodality is going to be an exercise in fomenting the same sort of confusion. Hmm. Ed, in the register, you reported that Cardinal Raymond Burke, the prefect emeritus of the Apostolic Signatura, said of New Way's ministry in this presentation, it is not proper that a member of the Synod of Bishops representing this high-level consultative body in the Church speak to an organization which is in dissent from the Church's teaching on the homosexual condition, on homosexual acts, and to express the idea that somehow the Church can be reconciled with these positions which are contrary to her teaching. Ed, how is Sister Bekar's presentation to New Way's ministry playing in Rome and among the bishops who may or may not be participating here? Well, I think some some welcomed it. They thought it was uh, part of the synodal process, so they, they thought it was quite a right for this sort of exchange to happen. Of course, others were not so happy, and uh, um, Ricardo Cascioli, interesting, the editor of the New Daily Compass, said that it was um, uh, really uh, just emblematic, really, of this tribe, this attempt to to try to legitimize the sort of LGBT agenda, because why don't they um, give lectures to to those uh, organizations like Courage, for example, which are faithful to the church's teaching? Mm -hmm. Why not give a lecture to them? And so he's saying it, it just it's, it's extremely disruptive, and um, because this group is, as you say, is dissenting. So so there is that. But I think one of the interesting things about this speech was the emphasis that Sister Natalie placed on the youth synod and also the um, the emphasis that, that, that the spokesman for the Synodal Bishops, the Synod of Bishops, um, Thierry Bonaventura, also said uh, to me in that article, uh, also stressing the Youth Synod. And the Youth Synod seems to have been deliberately uh, sort of organized to have this sort of platform for the homosexual agenda to, to become part of the Synodal discussions. They both refer to the final report of that Synod. Um, and the, the reference to homosexuality in there, and they've used it uh, precisely, uh, again, uh, quite openly, uh, to push this this agenda at this at this stage of the uh, of the synod on synodality. Hmm. Phil, I want to switch gears slightly here and uh, report on a letter that Pope Francis wrote to an Argentinian journalist. This was on April seventh in which he accuses journalists who speculate that he has supported Russian President Vladimir Putin of having a feces fetish. He writes, quote, Always in that information are some of the sins that journalists tend to fall into, disinformation, slander, defamation, coprophilia. I'm told some article authors get paid for this. Sad. A vocation as noble as communicating soiled in this way. Um, the Vatican so far has not commented on the Pope's letter, uh, Phil, uh, and this is not the first time the Pope has made this kind of comparison. In 2016, he made a similar comparison in a Belgian communication. Uh, but your reaction to this, Phil? Well, it's sad, really. It's uh, another example of the Pope being, frankly, nasty. I mean, that's not the sort of language that you would expect of a Roman pontiff, and it's just—it's very disappointing. It's disheartening 
uh, that we can't have at least an elevated sort of dialogue if we're going to have dialogue from the Vatican, from the Holy Father. It's, mm -hmm. what can I say? It's, it's not the sort of, it's not edifying. It's, it's not in, in accordance with his position. It degrades his authority. It's just very unfortunate. Yeah, I, I won't. I won't uh, unpack the the real meaning of that word. I'm being nice, calling it a fecal fetish. Um, Ed, during an interview on Good Friday last week, Pope Francis uh, awkwardly sat silent when a reporter said, "Quote: It's nearly three o'clock. How are we to live this hour today?" Pope Francis does not respond. He remains silent. He looks down, and then awkwardly, there's this long pause. Um, what have you heard to explain this silence? There is an explanation. Yes, I mean, that went uh, quite viral. A lot of, uh, a lot yes, of people picked up on it, especially here in, in Italy. Um, and I think, the, it, taken out of context, it did, it did look rather strange. I mean, he sat there for, for a full minute, uh, just, just in silence. Um, and uh, but but I think it was it, the context, of course, was Good Friday and the, and three o'clock being the the time of Christ's uh, death on the cross, and so and that hour, and so he was really um, I think reflecting on the, the the suffering and the meaning of the crucifixion during that time. But I think it uh, I think without seeing that context, it it did seem rather strange. And um, yeah, but, on but, TV but it was odd. Weird. But I get the. Yeah, I get the point. That he was he was he was meditating on the passion and taking a moment. But well, he also said um, just beforehand. He just said uh, the best response to Good Friday is silence. And then and then she asked him that question: How should we I spend see. this hour uh, for in Good Friday on Good Friday? Yeah. So then he yeah and and taken out of context, it did look a little you know bizarre on TV. But I'm glad you explained it. Uh, as Russian aggression worsens in the Ukraine. Patriarch Kirill, head of the Russian Orthodox Church, continues to support the war in Ukraine. In an open appeal last week, more than 320 Orthodox priests in Ukraine accused the Patriarch of Moscow of preaching heresy. And they've asked the global church leaders to bring him before a tribunal to decide whether he should be deposed. They write, quote, Kirill committed moral crimes by blessing the war against Ukraine and fully supporting the aggressive actions of Russian troops on Ukrainian territory. It is impossible for us to remain in any form of canonical submission to the Patriarch of Moscow. Um, Ed, I'm going to start with you, then, Phil. Pope Francis has met virtually with Kirill since the start of this Russian aggression. Uh, he's been very strong on the use of Russia, uh, r religion rather, by the Russians to justify this kind of violence. Obviously, Kirill doesn't care all that much. Uh, is there frustration at the Vatican about Moscow's continued invocation of religion to explain this aggressive behavior? I think there is, Raymond, yes. And, of course, the Pope, uh, Pope Francis and his predecessors have often said that, you know, we mu the, the, you cannot use uh, religion to justify war. And, and this is, seems to be very much along those lines. And, uh, but the Pope is, is sort of playing a rather a, a, tight, a tightrope here because he wants to keep good relations with Patriarch Kirill. They had a, mm -hmm. a, a very possible meeting lined up late this year before the conflict began. Before the war began in Iraq, in uh, Ukraine, and I think they they want to to keep that at least uh, ticking along and possible. And I think um, so. He's he's playing it rather carefully, uh, but at the same time, I think people are, are generally quite pleased with how he has handled this. That he hasn't um, made it too political. He hasn't named uh, Russia or Ukraine in his speeches. That's caused controversy, but it yeah. does at the same time leave leave a path of dialogue open for. For, uh, mm -hmm. for for dialogue and, and mediation, so um, so he's he's in a very tight spot. But I think they are they are yeah. concerned about Patriarch Kirill's uh, position. That's that's for sure. Phil, your reaction? It, the Pope is in a tight spot, and I think I agree with that. He's trying to walk that tight rope. Tight rope. I think that the issue of the Orthodox faith and its relation between Russia and Ukraine is the great. Uh, unknown of this conflict. The Orthodox Church in Ukraine is already split between those loyal to Moscow and those uh, who have broken off independently. And uh, Ukraine is a very religious country, uh, the biggest mm -hmm. Orthodox country probably in the world, uh, as far as practicing Orthodox. 
and uh, the Orthodox who were loyal to Moscow are ever less loyal as this war goes on. So that's a part of this war that we should keep an eye on because it has tremendous implications for the future of the faith there. Mm -hmm. uh, on Wednesday, very quickly, Ed, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, the Vatican Secretary of State, ordered that the Vatican's tight COVID restrictions will remain in place until April 30th, not only for the personnel, but for the visitors to the Vatican. Why was this decree put uh, out this week, when it's only valid for 10 more days, especially given that Italy and most EU countries are already easing their COVID restrictions? Yes, Raymond, it's a bit of a mystery. And um, it, the, the actual decree was signed uh, by the president of Vatican City State on March the 30th, but it wasn't made public until yesterday. Uh, and it's only valid until the end of the month. So uh, people are wondering and scratching their heads, why is this being released now? It may be partly because of reports that Cardinal Burke was was forbidden from entering the Vatican because he's he's not been vaccinated, but he has had COVID, of course. But that's um, he was he had COVID quite some time ago, and so he doesn't have this mm -hmm. this necessary super green pass that you need to enter the Vatican still. Um, and so this mm -hmm. may have been put out just to confirm that these rules are still in place, and that's why he wasn't allowed in. But uh, but it's, it is rather strange. And as you say, other nations are, are lifting these restrictions. Uh, England has lifted them completely and other countries. And so um, mm -hmm. so it is a, a mystery, especially as there have been no deaths recorded at the Vatican throughout this whole emergency. And the cases, of course, are, are very low. Um, so it is, a, it is very strange. Hmm. Phil, before I end, a big story getting very little attention. The Diocese of Camden, New Jersey, agreeing to pay $87.5 million this week in one of the biggest sex abuse settlements ever. Now, this came after New Jersey extended the statute of limitations for uh, victims. What's the takeaway here, and do you expect more of these mega settlements from dioceses? The settlements just keep coming, and honestly, the numbers don't make too much of an impression anymore. We're already well over $3 billion, $4 billion in total had, that has been spent on the legal settlements and legal fees associated with sex abuse scandal. It's just going to keep coming. Wow. We will leave it there, gentlemen. Uh, I thank you so much for your time. The indispensable reporting of the National Catholic Register's Ed Penton can be found on their website, and Ed is on Twitter at Edward Penton. And Phil Lawler's reporting and commentary is always at catholicculture.org. Thank you both.